meeting is reconvened and we're going to go right back to the ARSA committee. Deputy Commissioner Tessman, you ready to go? I am. All right, we're on item C. This is the UM Health and Medicine Update. Deputy Commissioner Tessman, will you introduce this topic? I will. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome Dean Reed Humphrey here uh, from the uh, University of Montana uh, Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences to talk a little bit about the cross-disciplinary efforts in uh, health and medicine known here as UMHM. So Dean Humphrey, welcome. Thank, thank you, Brock. Uh, Regent Sheehy, Chair Albrecht, Commissioner Christian, uh, colleagues across the Montana University system. I, I just received a uh, sticker here that says, I love bureaucracy uh, from uh, the master, the MPA program here. And I, so I want to thank my uh, the, predecessor, the preceding speaker, especially you, Joe, for taking us into lunch and not making me the last presenter before lunch. So thank, thank, you, thank you for that, actually. Uh, you know, in, in the past uh, academic year, the University of Montana made a commitment to develop uh, communities of excellence uh, where we look at uh, campus programs of strength uh, and where they intersect with, uh, with opportunity. Uh, about two years ago, uh, we developed the uh, UM Health and Medicine Initiative, uh, which is in many respects a uh, sort of a community's prototype, if you will. And what I'd like to do is share with you the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, where we're headed with this community and how it sort of helps us lay the groundwork for thoughts going forward. Uh, we are on the web, uh, so if you go to forward slash UMHM, uh, what I would encourage uh, everyone to do, if you do nothing else with this website, but there's an experience uh, tab in the middle, and I would encourage you to at some point to, uh, to click on that tab and have a look at our interprofessional uh, uh, student video uh, really sh uh, demonstrates nicely how students on this campus are uh, are working together in uh, in an interdisciplinary fashion across the campus and uh, uh, this was a, one of the first important steps that we took with uh, with UM Health and Medicine was to establish a portal where uh, in the th actually in the theme of this morning's conversation about uh, attracting uh, students uh, to a university setting for to embark on their careers. Uh, uh, sometime prior to the development of this portal, if you came to UM, if you looked at UM for a career in the health or uh, health sciences or uh, health careers or biomedical sciences, you pretty much had to do some serious forensics to find programs. Now it's one stop uh, where you can find one of our 55 different degree programs where you can gain the experiences that you need to get into post-baccalaureate programs where you can make decisions early about uh, tracking into the health sciences or health careers and uh, where you can connect to clinics and laboratories on our campus to gain those experiences so that, uh, so you really have that robust uh, application going forward. The, uh, uh, so our mission is, has always been twofold. One was to enrich the academic experience on campus uh, and across the campus uh, for prospective students and as well as matriculated students. And secondly, uh, which I think is really a very important, and that's improving the health of Montanans, which I think is our, our collective mission through partnerships and outreach. Uh, we, we, we do this, and I won't read all this to you. I th actually, this will thread itself through this uh, short presentation, but it is about coordinating a comprehensive approach to recruiting students and retaining them, uh, getting them uh, tuned in early, strengthening our relationships with our regional academic programs and partners, and as well as clinicians and hospitals and other places to understand exactly what we need to do to ensure that our graduates get the experiences they need to, uh, to engage in rapidly health uh, changing healthcare environment, uh, strengthening our relationships with community and regional partners, uh, providing oversight for collaboration uh, across the campus, and uh, that's been really quite eye-opening since we started this initiative. And finally, of course, facilitating robust research initiatives. And this will, again will thread through uh, through this presentation. Some of our major activities, things we're focused on right now, uh, interconnecting the campus academic environment, uh, and you'll see evidence of all of these momentarily building a widespread, robust community of learners, uh, engaging in the community, and I'll, I'll reflect on several initiatives there, uh, as well as how, we're how we are engaging uh, our partners, our diverse partners across uh, the Montana, the, st the state of Montana through both health, ed through health education screening, as well as partnerships. I'll reflect for a moment on some of our joint programs. We currently, uh, UM is, uh, my, 
is currently working with MSUB, as, uh, as, as the regents know, to develop an occupational therapy program. You will be seeing, I, I trust, at some point, a because uh, we've, we've been wrapping up the uh, this proposal on a, a, uh, a institute for interprofessional education and collaborative practice, which would be a collaborative relationship primarily between uh, my college and the College of Nursing at MSU, but is really meant to be an MUS-wide initiative to bring best practices uh, to the to the system and to the healthcare environment. And uh, likewise, UMHM supports global interprofessional uh, initiatives. We've sent students and faculty to places like Thailand, Ethiopia, Borneo, to work with uh, uh, local universities and populations on, uh, on how we might interprofessionalize their environment. Uh, just a couple words about uh, enriching the campus-wide environment. This is, uh, I like to say, from Missoula College. And when I put the slide together and later, I thought maybe it, maybe it was really the river campus because we, uh, and this is our, uh, these are some of our faculty members from our two-year programs, from respiratory therapy to surge tech and others. And they're sporting, you can't read that, but they're sporting our uh, UMHM Missoula College uh, instructional garb, which they're proud to wear. But importantly, it connects that river campus to the mountain campus. Uh, we're working very intentionally to ensure that students who get traction at Missoula College can begin to see beyond that if they wish and to connect to programs that, uh, that might lead them to a deeper career in, uh, in, uh, in health, medicine, or biomedical research. This uh, is a kiosk, uh, which uh, you probably, uh, if you didn't see it, it's down on the first floor of the UC. We just launched it. But this is a kiosk where, we, where we're, doing, we're doing screenings, uh, we do bike fittings, we do wellness assessments. But the point being that each, each, of our, each of our academic partners will have a presence there on a fixed schedule. So and we're, we're now uh, initiating our uh, UMHM leadership fellows, which are st students who are actually in these programs who will be available to talk to parents or, or prospective students or students who haven't made a decision yet about careers. And, They'll be able to stop in, perhaps get a screening, and then learn more about those programs. So the idea being that we want to be in the center of, uh, of campus with this interprofessional uh, opportunity. Uh, this is our Community of Learners project. This is one of the first projects uh, after we developed the, the web portal. And that was to connect the university's uh, activities to students, matriculated students first, certainly. Uh, but likewise to high school students and others so that they could begin to see what we're doing on this campus, both in terms of academic programming, but also relevant publications, speakers who are coming to campus, trying to get out in front of, uh, of, the, uh, of this community. And uh, actually, after a two-year period, we're now, uh, we're now robustly expanding the community of learners to include parents, teachers, advisors, and counselors. So a lot of others are opting in. Uh, this was a welcome back from last year uh, when we had such terrible, a ter pretty terrible uh, uh, wildfire environment, and we had just published papers on particulate matter, and uh, and uh, we connected the students to Climate Smart Missoula, for example, to get HEPA filter. So in the community as well, uh, we publish this periodically. If you go to the web page, you can find all of our past issues under archives. Uh, in the community, uh, uh, this is our Tool Street locate the Tool Street location, uh, and. Uh, where our Spectrum Health Lab is, uh, which is a science and technology lab. And uh, since Google Maps uh, juxtaposes everything in our community to breweries, uh, if you take a left at Conflux or right at Imagine and another right at Drought Works, you'll be at the Tool Street location. The, uh, uh, but <laughs> the, uh, but in, this is a really cool center because in, in, in it's not UMHM Center, it's Spectrum, uh, which, is, uh, which is our science and technology initiative that gets kids in, in there to do interactive experiments and see that there may be a future for them. And, uh, but in the, uh, in the past year, we, we've expanded that to include a UM Health and Medicine Health Lab. So when you go into the Tool Street location, kids go in there uh, and, uh, on the weekends and evenings with their parents. Uh, and uh, they can do interactive experiments on, on uh, pulse oximetry and blood pressure and nutrition, and learn about those things. But likewise, as you'll see, learn about health career pathways and how they can get there. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, entire uh, venture will also be moving to the, uh, the new Missoula Public Library, uh, which is directly across the street from the Dram Shop. Sorry, I just had to say. Uh, in, uh, on Front Street, and this is, uh, is going to be an extraordinary library because it's the All Under One Roof project where uh, you can't quite see it, but underneath the Donate Now, because I had to, sneak, I had to snag that from their website, 
this it opens in 2020, and what's right in the center is a double helix climbing uh, facility that we're now designing, which will take kids through 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 the university's efforts to uh, to bring kids into that into that focus and also uh, into uh, into health. So that'll be in the library. Very briefly, our rural outreach. Uh, we're trying. We're doing this in a number of different ways. Our mission is to prepare practitioners to work in rural and underserved environments, uh, and so we've done that through, we're trying to do that through a number of ways. Uh, uh, we, we have a team that's been uh, really seeing literally thousands of points of contact across our, our partners, our diverse partners across the, uh, across the state with health screenings, with educational opportunities and the like. Uh, our family medical residency program, which I, I know the, uh, the regents will likely hear more about tomorrow at the community breakfast. Uh, but I did want to emphasize just a couple of things, and that is that we've developed this network, as you can see, of, of rural sites. Uh, this is a, you know, the residency program is, is actually sponsored by the University of Montana. Uh, and I think a, 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 uh, maybe an unintended or perhaps an intended consequence has been our ability then as a, as a sponsor of a, of a program that prepares physicians and having physician faculty, we've been able to engage those faculty and residents into our on-campus training programs in clinical medicine and other areas. So it's been a huge value-added piece for us, and I can't stress how important that's been for all of our health professions programs. There is a, res a family medicine residency program on the other side of the divide and uh, out of Billings, and, and I think, uh, and this is a really important slide, uh, maybe not for UM Health and Medicine, but for all of us in Montana, and that is solving the healthcare shortage uh, of physicians and across Montana. This is some very brief data, and the key, the key numbers are uh, we've graduated 30 students from our residency, 30 residents, 22 are in Montana at 73%, and the number of physicians who are practicing in rural and underserved areas is now 80%, uh, and that is uh, incrementally helping solve uh, a uh, primary care crisis uh, in Montana, and cr quite frankly, in the Pacific Northwest. Importantly, that the, the, the prior slide shows the sites, and, and so from my perspective, what we're trying to do is, is use that as a scaffolding for the interprofessional training of other healthcare professionals. Uh, so I, can't, uh, I just can't stress enough how important the residency program has been uh, to both this university uh, and, and the state of Montana. Finally, I just wanted to mention our, our improving health for rural Montanans. This is the, our, our iFarm program where we is, uh, which because it was developed originally out of, the, out of the School of Pharmacy, but it's now an interprofessional team that travels all over Montana. You can see the data yourself, over 18,000 residents that we've seen, uh, and uh, trying to extend the reach of, uh, of, uh, uh, of our ability to, uh, to help screen for, for, for uh, Sentinel events and the like. So uh, that was the, uh, like the, the foot to the floor tour of, of health and medicine. There's uh, uh, a lot that we've been doing uh, relative to building this interprofessional collaborative collaboration. We're really excited about our ability to, uh, to continue to connect with, the, uh, with, our, with our academic partners across the system. Uh, and uh, in the interest of uh, time, I'll, uh, I'll conclude that and entertain questions from the group. Thank you. Questions or comments? President Bogner. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just I uh, want to echo Dean Humphrey and, and first thank you for your leadership on this. We've, uh, as we articulated these communities of excellence earlier this year, it really was in the spirit of you heard from Grant Keir earlier the you know his request of the university system break down barriers institutionally uh, and across disciplines and help us better understand how to work and collaborate with the university. And I think. This health and medicine initiative and its embodiment through our community of excellence called health and human development is a great example of, of doing just that. And when you do so, I, I think you get three really distinct advantages. And one that Reed talked about is you, you provide pathways for students. So I'm not sure as a student if I want to be a physical therapist or a pharmacist or maybe a, a, a biologist, but I understand I want to be in the field of health and medicine. And I'm not sure which college that looks like, but, but I can have a pathway and this, this does that. It enables much more uh, effective and robust research and, and teaching across these disciplines. And finally, those community relationships and partnerships. And I think that UMHM's done a, a fantastic job uh, in the, the residency program and the others that, that Reed's mentioned is a great example that we're looking to build upon. So thank you to, to Dean Humphrey for your leadership on this. Thank you, sir. 
Chair Albrecht. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm wondering um, with what's holding us back from even sending more through um, even the Family Medi Medical Residency Program and some of the other programs. So, so, so thank you, uh, Fran. The, you know, there, there is clearly, a, if you look at any of the workforce data, we know we're, you know, there's about a 30 to 40 percent need for healthcare practitioners from physicians all the way through. You, it's, it's hard to find any, any area where there's not a shortage. So, and that's going to persist for at least then or well beyond the next decade. That's as far as we can find reliable uh, data. Uh, actually, the uh, uh, interestingly enough, I, the, the rate limiting factor for most health professions programs is actually clinical placement. And, and uh, so that, uh, you know, it's interesting, it's not really a university constraint so much as it is uh, being able to get uh, our, uh, our students into rotations where they can gain the experiences they need to sit for licensure. And that's, a, that's an issue that, that uh, Missoula College faces in their two-year programs. Uh, it's not so much an issue for the number of students that we have admitted at UM. But our, but our ability to take that significantly forward uh, is limited a bit by, uh, mostly by clinical placement. And then, we'll have, there, then there's fundamental funding issues, but, but nothing that I don't think we couldn't overcome. Uh, but uh, that's where there's gonna be, I think, some real opportunity in online learning uh, is gonna be an important part of this, uh, certainly. But on the other side of, of personnel, the other, uh, I think the other innovative piece that we have to address is how, we're, how, how robustly we're doing telehealth and how we are able to improve the health uh, health care of, of uh, people who live in, in really rural areas mm -hmm. where it's very difficult to place practitioners. But mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a big objective of ours is, is to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. I have one too. Uh, Dean, are, th are there efforts to um, advertise this in, as part of recruitment? Have we gone that far? Uh, well, yes, to the degree that, uh, uh, yeah, well, the short answer is yes. And, the, uh, uh, and a good example of that is what it was a slide where we've been in, uh, on the reservation in, the tribal, in tribal communities uh, where, where, in other communities where before we, would, we used to recruit sort of uh, uh, in a targeted way, like we're going to recruit kids for the health, uh, for, for medicine, or we're going to recruit kids for PT. And now what we've done through this initiative is, 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 is consolidated our recruitment to the health professions. And that gives us an economy of scale for recruitment. So UMHM shows up at the Montana Hospital Association meeting. We sponsor as many events as we can. So we're out there uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to optimize recruitment. Uh, but I think the health labs are that we're doing and can be done in pop-up locations in, uh, in, uh, across the state is also a really cool way to, to reach kids inexpensively. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Thank you for the time, thanks. My pleasure, thank you. Move on to uh, item D, Rural Educators Recruitment and Retention Update, Director McLean. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board. Great to be with you this afternoon. I heard a lot of enthusiasm and interest during the last board meeting about the Masters of Arts in Teaching that emanated from Montana State University, and we thought in the Office of the Commissioner that it would be appropriate to give this board an update of the achievements of the Recruitment and Retention Task Force since your last report happened in the spring of 2017, a number of programs and opportunities have been implemented across the state. And we think that there's some real exciting momentum around this conversation and it's happening really in all four corners and everything in between. And so I just wanna give you a real quick overview of some of these achievements of the task force and speak to them quickly and then leave the rest of the time for questions and comments from you. The first couple of items here are revisions to administrative rules. You have 1057-413 and 1057-410 and 1057-421. And what those are, are revisions to K-12 licensure standards. And what those will allow for is flexibility in licensing. One in particular that lends itself to recognizing five years of out-of-state experience for both teachers in the classroom and administrators across the state. And then 
The second one is the revisions to the class four licensure and what that allows for is a high school teacher to teach an Edu 101 course for current technical education credit and we think that that was a real opportunity for us to expand CTE offerings across the state in some of our most rural and isolated communities and at the same time expand dual enrollment offerings for our K-12 kiddos across Montana. The third thing that you see here is the quality educator loan forgiveness opportunity and there was legislation passed during the last legislation during the last legislature but unfortunately it was not funded as you heard earlier and we're pleased to note that just as of this morning we think that that's going to be added into a bill going forward and we'll see some funding to that and we think that's really critical to the conversation but we did see as a result of the last session rurality and poverty added to the conversation around quality educator loan forgiveness in our most rural and isolated communities. So we saw that as a win, even though it wasn't funded. And then item four, stipends for nationally board certified teachers. Those were increased, especially in high need areas across the state. And we're excited again about an opportunity to continue to support that effort as an opportunity to support greater retention of our teachers across the state. And then finally, we partnered with the Northwest Regional Education Labs on a survey so that we could get to the bottom of what is happening and paint a more clear picture for you and for other policymakers around the state around what is happening with K-12 educators and their mobility across the state. And so what we gleaned early on from some of the presentations around that data were two pieces here and what I outlined clearly here were two pieces of data and then what we can do as a task force as far as moving the needle to get to a different place. And without further ado then, I'll open it up to you for any questions or comments that you may have. Regents? Regent Lozar. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Angela. Uh, just as a reminder, Edu 101, now is that, is that the class that introduces folks to the, to the profession of teaching? Regent Lozar, members of the board, that is absolutely correct. And what we're trying to do right now is fine tune what an Edu 101 course would look like all across the state and make sure that if a student takes that course, that it will be seamless in transfer and seamless in portability for every single student and it will have meaning for them. And just to follow up, so that would that course then be offered through dual enrollment in the high schools? That so is absolutely creation, what creation is happening pipeline. now and we hope to continue to grow the numbering of Edu 101 offerings across the state. And what's unique about that course is it can be offered in almost every single K-12 community across the state for dual enrollment. And that makes it really unique and it creates an opportunity for dual enrollment where perhaps no other opportunities for dual enrollment exists because there's not a teacher's, teacher with a master's degree. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Director McLean. Thank you. Next item is item E, program reviews. Director Teal. Uh, Madam Chair, if I, oh. if I may, uh, Director Teal uh, is going to actually cover the next uh, three items, so the program reviews, the level one memorandum, and uh, the intent to plans. So. We, we figured we'd try and make this efficient. Uh, Sounds like a good idea. So, uh, Chair Sheehy, members of the committee, uh, program reviews are mandated by board policy 303.3. .3. And what occurs is every seven years, campuses run through the entire slate of Board of Regents approved programs that are above the Certificate of Technical Studies level. And this is an opportunity for campuses to develop a process, to assess the quality of programs, to look at the number of graduates in programs, and decide whether they want to tweak the offering, pull it from the books, or continue offering it or enhance it in some way. Uh, the 2018 uh, bolded hyperlinks link you to each campus's program reviews and, and you can see their recommendations for each program that was reviewed this year. Any questions, comments? 
Joe, I think we can move on to item F, the level one memorandum. These are the delegated items. That is correct, Regent Sheehy. Uh, the level one memorandum are items, academic proposal items that you have delegated to the commissioner's office or to the campuses to decide and approve. Uh, these are reviewed each month by all of the chief academic officers across the system, and you have in front of you uh, the level one items for August and September. Any questions? Joe, moving on to item G, the intent to plan proposals. This is notice only. Absolutely. So, Regent Sheehy, members of the committee, what's new here are the September intent to plan proposals. Uh, and these are intended to give you, the board, and also all campuses in the system advance notice of new programs that might be coming forward for level two consideration. Uh, I know that I want to turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Tesman for a particular comment on one of these. Thanks, Joe. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, <clears throat> prior to uh, lunch, you heard me introduce the level two proposals, and I described them as the culmination of a very long process uh, that involves um, communication, collaboration, and problem solving along the way. And the intent to plan uh, proposals are meant to kick off that whole process. And we have a couple of intent to plans um, to present to the board today. And I would just uh, use as, as one example um, the PhD program in earth science and engineering from Montana Tech. Um, this is, this is the, the kickoff of, of a long process. Uh, I, I think that there's been good work done at Montana Tech. We've already had conversations with uh, Montana State University and the University of Montana. Uh, there need to be a lot more conversations between those three campuses. Joe and I have asked explicitly for a, um, a memorandum from those three campuses outlining potential areas for collaboration, uh, potential obstacles that might be uh, down the road for a program like this. And I think, as is the case with any new program, and certainly as is the case with any uh, new doctoral program, one might describe uh, the climb as, uh, as, as steep and challenging, and if you make it through that climb, then it's uh, a great product and a great program you end up with. But I just wanna emphasize that this is the beginning of a conversation and not the culmination as we would see in the level two uh, proposals. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I have a question. Um, the second item that came up in September was the Institute for Interprofessional Education, and I noticed that that's a University of Montana, Montana State University collaboration. We've been talking a lot about that, and I just wanted to highlight it and get any comments you had about that uh, working together. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, and, and perhaps Joe can expand on this, but my understanding is that this is actually, uh, it's kind of a second trip through the cycle for this uh, institute because, uh, Joe, it, it's, it's been approved um, from the UM side, is that correct? And now it's coming so, back so correct. through the This is actually side. the yeah. second time yeah. you have, have seen this institute come up here, and it's because uh, we took further time to make sure this was run through all of Montana State University's internal processes for review and comment uh, so that it could be submitted as a fully collaborative institute, which, uh, as you heard this morning, we, we really have one other example of the Institute on Ecosystems. So, so Dean Humphrey, in a prior presentation, talked about this institute briefly. Interprofessional education is becoming uh, more important in the health fields, and this is meant to be the cross-state place where that type of education can occur. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? That brings us to the end of our ARSA agenda. Thank you, Joe. And uh, this part of the meeting is done. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Okay, okay. At this point of the meeting, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the chair of the Budget Administration and Finance Committee, Regent Lozar. Chair Lozar. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, let's, get, let's get going on the Budget Admin and Finance Committee meeting. So we've we met as a committee last week and sort of walked through each of the items um, 
uh, both in cons consent, sort of a little more in depth, and, um, and, and then through each, each of the action items. Uh, so today's agenda kind of covers a wide variety of different things. We'll, we'll have six or seven individuals that will come up and sort of assist us in the dialogue um, based on the different agenda items. Um, and, then, um, and then we'll go through uh, quite a few different information items that are pretty diverse in nature. Uh, so let's, let's start with the, the consent agenda. The consent agenda has uh, both staff items and has maritime faculty items. And um, before we move past them, I wanna ask if any members of the committee would like, or the board would like to move any items uh, down for, below for further conversation. Yeah, uh, Regent Sheehy. I have questions regarding the labor agreements. I was wondering if we could pull those off. Item D. Sure. Um, so Regent Shee has asked for consent item D, labor agreements to be moved. I, just looking at the rest of the agenda, I propose that we move that down right above action item A. Um, they're very similar in nature in terms of agreements and, and uh, staff compensation. So any, any other items that members of the board or committee would like to move down? Excellent. Okay, so seeing none, let's move on to uh, action item A, or I'm sorry, uh, consent D, um, which is labor agreements. I know uh, Deputy Commissioner McCray uh, is at the end of the table. He'll be able to assist us with this item. But in essence, um, this item covers, let's see, this item covers the uh, the labor agreements that are uh, union represented positions. Um, it's my understanding back in May, we did 12, uh, agreed to 12 of those labor agreements out of 24. Um, this is, um, uh, Kevin has been working hard on the labor agreements. We have four additional ones uh, that we have in front of us. Uh, those being um, having the same uh, wage increase uh, across all, all the labor agreements that we've uh, f uh, finished to date, of which is a 2% um, increase on base salary or base wage, um, which, is, which is effective February 1st of 2019. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that? So that's, that's consent D, which is now uh, action A, A1. Uh, any comments on that? Yes, Regent Sheehy. I wondered how we arrived at the two across two percent across the board increase. Was that a negotiated term, uh, Mr. Chairman? Regent Sheehy, yes, that was a negotiated term with the bargaining agents. May I keep? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, also wondered, where are we in the cycle? We have four agreements before us today. It sounded like we have four others coming, or are we just, where are we in the cycle of completing our union agreements? Regent Sheehy, uh, if, if these four are approved, we will have 16 of the 24 approved, those 16 covering about 91, 92% of the unionized employees uh, still uh, negotiating eight others. Uh, I would anticipate having more on the January agenda that, that will be settled by then. How is this in the typical cycle? Are we on track? Are we behind? What? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Regent Sheehy, we're, we're on track in the typical cycle. It, it seems a little bit late in the biennium, but that's because for this particular biennium, the implementation of the pay raise is late in the biennium. So normally, uh, it, 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 you have to work your way up towards the implementation date of that uh, pay action for the last of the agreements to kind of come home and roost. Okay, that's what I, those were my questions. Excellent. Any other questions from the committee or members of the board? So let's move on to uh, action item A, which is FY19 pay plan. Uh, this item does a couple different things. So it, it, it covers um, base wage increase on the non-union represented classified uh, staff, as well as the non-unit uh, represented contract faculty professional 
administrative personnel. So a couple different classes of, uh, of our staff, um, those being non-union represented. So it's, it's very different than the consent, uh, consent D item. Um, there's a couple things that I just wanted to note on this, this item as it relates to the, those two categories uh, that are, sets them apart a little bit is one, uh, the, the contract date. So for the union, non-union represented contract faculty, they have to be employed um, by July 1st, so the beginning of the fiscal year to participate in, um, in this wage increase that we're considering. And then the uh, non-union represented classified staff have to be on uh, January 30th. So the difference really is uh, there's a, it's a little more restricted for our non-union contracted professionals. Um, and then the uh, classified non-union is very similar uh, in nature to the other state agencies uh, in terms of uh, their start date. So th those are the two factors that make those um, areas different, but yet they're the same 2% and they're the same as the 2% for uh, the union represented positions. I'd also call attention to uh, the, the attachment A. Um, so attachment A is uh, for the 13 individuals that this board, when we changed our policy this time last year, we went from a, a much longer group of board approved um, contracts that we consider uh, every year. We reduce that down to 13, essentially the heads of the, of, um, the units. Uh, and then the deputy commissioners uh, and high-level staff at, at OCHI. And so what you see on the spreadsheet is the same proposal, which is the 2% uh, increase. Um, and that's, again, starting with a July 1st um, contract date. So I will, st I will stop there and see if we have any, any questions on action item A. Uh, Regent Sheehy. Um, I have a question about the deferred compensation component of the commissioner section. Sure. How do we arrive at that number? Um, it says annual. Is that just going to be renewed annually? What are we voting on there? Uh, that, that's a great question, Regent Sheehy. And maybe I'll kick it off and, and Kevin can, um, can fill in uh, all the things that I missed. So uh, deferred comp uh, being sort of a delayed, delayed income um, is a, has been a part of, in this case, the commissioner's compensation um, since he started as it was used as a sort of a recruiting tool and as a retention tool. And uh, the, the amount that you see here, the 53,000 was the amount um, that the board had set in 2012 um, and so what this is doing here is sort of continuing um, that compensation that we had as a board agreed to for uh, the, the commissioner's salary. So we did skip a year um, last year and we're bringing this back up um, to the board for consideration. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, Regent Sheehy, uh, I, I concur with that analysis. It is continuation of the level that was in place when the, the first board negotiated um, with the commissioner in, in the uh, recruitment process. And as, as far as um, what it would mean going forward, it, it, if approved, it would continue the contributions at that current level until and unless the board ever wanted to revisit that with the commissioner. So it would continue annually at that level. Thank you, Kevin. Any other questions from the committee? Oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Regent Sheehy, you, you oh. had your hand. I am fully supportive of the 2% raise across the board. I think that that's, uh, it's a hefty raise at the higher levels. It increases the salaries by quite a bit, the higher up on the pay scale that you get, obviously. But I, I understand the methodology of the 2%. Um, I, I disagree with the um, deferred compensation portion of the commissioner's salary. 
Um, I say that with uh, the utmost respect for our commissioner and the job that he's done and the job that he's doing. I, I know how hard Clay works for this university system. Here's my deal. I think we just raised his salary to 375 by increasing this. Uh, I went back through the minutes of the 2012 um, deferred compensation system. To me, that doesn't say that this goes on forever, that this is a component of the salary. I would be much more comfortable having an actual discussion about what is what do we intend to pay our commissioner out of our pocket. I recognize the worth of a deferred compensation system. I understand that it can save an employer a lot of money, but the fact of the matter is it's deferred only to the employee. It's not deferred on our end. We pay that 53,000 out of pocket. So to me, this raises the salary for the commissioner up to a level that I'm not comfortable with in a base salary kind of way. Um, I don't think that that was guaranteed, but here's my other thing. I can certainly understand why our employee would think that. I can see how that expectation arises, and the reason that I don't want to get into this system of compensating without just saying the total amount that we're out and taking this portion out, uh, I think it creates expectations all the way down the line that we haven't really made a decision about. I think it gives the deputy commissioners and all of the directors and everybody else a thought, well, I should be making a certain percentage of what the top guy makes. So I'm uncomfortable with that. And I would prefer that we actually decide as a board, this is what we're paying our commissioner and not divide these out and create expectations as to deferred compensation systems. That's my, um, my concern, and I express that concern by saying I don't think that we should do performance funding. This item is called uh, performance enhancement or performance stipend, renewed performance. I don't think that ever was a performance stipend, and I don't think as a board that rotates membership, we should do performance-based compensation. That's just my bent. I just don't think that we're equipped to do it meeting the way we do and turning over as a board. I don't think we can consistently do that well. So that wouldn't be my preferred method of doing that. But I do think that we need to assess what we want to pay this position and then determine whether or not that job is being fulfilled. We've already determined that our commissioner is doing a very good job. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Um, any other members have any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, Regent Albrecht. Uh, Deputy Commissioner McCray, could you speak to uh, the reality of, of how this compares uh, compensation-wise? Uh, I mean, we've done deferred compensation and utilized that as a tool for our other leaders. Um, so I disagree with Regent Sheehy on this matter, and I want to make sure that I'm understanding accurately that it is not an increase as she describes, but it is actually within the pay compensation package. Mr. Chairman, Regent Albrecht, the four surrounding states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Idaho, the average, and we do use university president salaries to correlate to uh, and, and partly determine the commissioner's salary in the history of the Montana University system anyway um, for th the last 46 years or since the Board of Regents was created. The presidents of Montana State University and the University of Montana have uh, received the same salary and the commissioner's already always received a little bit more as the direct supervisor of the presidents. Okay, so that said, m much of the survey data that we have uh, is based on presidential salary because not all states have a state system commissioner of a governing, strong governing board and so forth. That said, the presidential salaries in the four surrounding states at the doctoral institutions, the average base salary is $364,000 and the uh, average base plus additional comp, such as deferred comp, is $380,000. From a technical aspect, since you've asked the question, I would just respectfully observe that in my human resources 
um, view that this deferred compensation proposal from an employer's perspective that it is deferred. It's as deferred as deferred compensation can possibly get for the employer. The, the employer pays it up front and soon so it can then be used for the benefit of growing and the employer does not pay FICA or other taxes on it, so gets a tax consequence. It is cheaper to the employer than it would be to pay in salary and has realized a savings to the taxpayer uh, for the commissioner position and to the taxpayer and tuition payers for the president's deferred compensation. So follow-up clarifying questions. So for example, the deferred comp that we have, uh, have chosen to do for um, our president at MSU, that is not even, that's not stated on here. It was, it's already in action, correct? So it doesn't compare on this list. Correct, and, and the deferred compensation in the Commissioner of Higher Education's first five years saved the taxpayer about $188,000 or more, if you consider the, the FICA or the tax savings, then would have, it would have cost to, to pay it up front in salary at the time. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Yeah, Regent Tuss. Thank you. Um, I, I, hope, I hope I can uh, ask this question correctly, um, Deputy Commissioner. As I understand it, the, the 53505, um, the, the actual deferred compensation amount the commissioner will receive when receiving that down the line, aren't we buying an actual smaller compensation amount than we did the first round, and that has to do with the commissioner's age. That's correct. I mean, could you explain that? I so so in, the, in the first five-year arrangement, there was a near guaranteed benefit. So these contributions that averaged 53,505 in the five-year window period was to provide um, a, a benefit that would have equated to less than slightly less than $50,000 a year for, for 10 years. If you contribute the same amount going forward because of the demographics and um, uh, time to grow of the investment, it's about a 40% reduction in the benefit. Although the, the proposal before us does not presume that uh, it has to be structured, the new contributions towards the uh, defined guaranteed benefit. However, the point is the same, uh, that, that contributing the same level uh, of contribution will indeed undoubtedly uh, lead towards a lower amount of earnings because there's less time for the investment to grow. So, so, so as a follow-up, just, just so I'm real clear about the, this, the, we, we are contributing the same amount, 53,505, but that 40% doing the math in my head, instead of about 50, it probably is going to be a net of perhaps 35-ish? Closer to 30, 30 oh. 31. Okay. So, so in a nutshell, cor correct. Um, that while the contribution is the same, the benefit to be received by the employee will be a lower amount. Important clarification, thank you. So one second, uh, Regent Nice. I just wanna kinda go back to the compensation um, and I think I have a different perspective than Regent Sheehy in the sense that uh, when the commissioner was brought on and then the presidents were brought on, their compensa total compensation was uh, using base salary and using deferred because it was a benefit to the employer, uh, to us, because um, there were cost savings, and yet they did not, um, uh, we were still, still able to retract and, and retain um, high-performing individuals. So I think the total compensation that we're talking about, uh, if we look at the first five years, uh, the commissioner's um, tenure, and then you look at the sixth year, there was a significant drop um, in his compensation. And what we're doing today is bringing that compensation, the total compensation, um, back up to where we were in the past. Granted, there's been a couple years of 2%, 1.5% increases. That all said, um, you know, uh, Deputy Commissioner McCray mentioned the, the, the average total of the, the regional peers 
presidents are at 380. That's not commissioners, um, which in my perspective, the, the commissioner is, is working in partnership and, and you know, supervising in some ways the, the, the presence of the, of the university system and that his position likely would be higher. And so when we're talking 380, we're talking the president. So even continuing this deferred compensation for the total package still leaves us uh, about $8,000 short to the, uh, the, the median average of our peers for presidents. So we're still short and um, I know conversations that, um, that, that in this case the, the commissioner is okay with this, not being at the exact level of the regional peers or being compared to regional commissioners, which is really challenging for us. So I think that's an important thing to bring out is the total compensation still, we're still short um, of just the average of folks that are presidents in, in our region. So with that, uh, Regent Nystuen. Thank you, Ch thank you, Chair Lozar. Um, I, I've just I stand in support of uh, this entire schedule here, and including the deferred uh, compensation for the commissioner. Um, I felt like this last year or two that the uh, <clears throat> commissioner has actually taken a pay reduction because we did not timely continue uh, the de deferred compensation piece along the way here, and to me. For a high-performing uh, commissioner, I, that just didn't square well with me. Um, as far as the two percent goes, and I have to take my private sector hat off, but these days with employment levels where they are, uh, unemployment levels as low as they are, we are uh, oftentimes in business and industry seeing at least three percent to oftentimes four percent salary increases by virtue of what's happening here right now. When I look at the list of, of folks that are on here right now, I marvel at their accomplishments um, each time I read the agenda. You know, when you look at the agenda today and those campus reports uh, for these 13 individuals plus the, uh, the associated staff of the commissioner's office here, it's truly amazing. I, I read the, the, the accomplishments of the campus campuses and the rainmakers on those campuses are the CEOs and uh, many of their other uh, colleagues. Secondly, I take a look at the challenges that they all face, we all face, as it relates to budgetary challenges uh, for funding our university system. Uh, many of the campuses are indeed trying to figure out how to bridge the gap financially these days with fewer dollars that are, have been available. Uh, I'm optimistic that maybe we can continue to find ways to, to, uh, to move the, the fiscal ball down the field as it relates to more dollars, but nevertheless, we ultimately put the burden upon uh, Commissioner Christian and the CEOs and their staff to figure out a way to do more with less, and they do it admirably. I also want to take a look at these uh, campus professionals and the work that they do with their alumni and their foundation. The incredible millions of dollars that flow into these campuses uh, is in loud support for what we are doing on our campuses. And again, the core to all of this has to do with the CEOs. It was great pleasure to be in Butte and look at the Student Success Center. We were in Billings for the Yellowstone Hall. Uh, look at what the Washington family has contributed here. That is a vote of confidence for these particular campuses and a vote for the CEOs. I also want to take a look at the millions of dollars that flow into these campuses in the area of research. Those dollars, $200 million, if memory serves me correctly, is an important, important part of the fabric of this, of this state. And I just would like to, know, to, to, to echo that it all comes because of the people that we have in these leadership positions. And finally, when we look at our agenda, the other thing that is a common thread at every community breakfast that we hold on a Friday morning is the absolute respect and admiration that our campus com leaders have with the public in their, in their communities. The, it, sometimes it goes on for at least an hour of uh, singing the praises of our campuses. And again, many times it's often highlighted uh, with, the, with the work of the campus CEOs and so forth. The second thing, uh, the other part of this too has to do with the folks that are, that are part of Commissioner Christian's office on that. Um, they work incredibly long hours, and you know what, coming here in about a month and a half, 
uh, they'll burn the candle at both ends as we head into a legislative session, tirelessly working for our system here. Um, some of the weighty decisions that we have to make, whether it's in the legal arena, contract negotiations, um, the, f the fiscal ends of things that, uh, that Deputy Commissioner Trevor works on, it's truly amazing. And so uh, I want to continue to send a vote of confidence that, Commissioner, um, I'm going to say yes, absolutely, to your deferred comp, is the 2% increases for you and the other folks that are on this list. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your comments, Regent Nystuen. Other comments from members of the committee or the board? Uh, Regent Sheehy. In, follow up to Bob. Uh, my stance is not a vote of no confidence or a vote of reduced confidence. I have the utmost confidence in our commissioner. I just want that to be really clear. I just have a different idea about what, the, what we did in 2012 and whether that should be carried on as an as a going forward that is my thing thank you regent Sheehy. uh just to wrap up this conversation Mr. Chairman, unless uh, there's Casey, a, any I, other I should have given you some information you asked for some data uh, there's only one job match in the four surrounding states uh, so there's a, a comparable commissioner position in north dakota and the base salary there is 372 so just for information purposes okay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And I, I just wanted to wrap up the conversation by thanking you for all of your work on the labor agreements. I know it, it can be complex, and um, I know it puts, you put a lot of time into that. And so thank you for bringing the four to us as well as the classified. Far more people, far more people than, than me. Uh, me. Me the least. There are plenty of campus folks on both sides of the table, administration and uh, faculty and staff union people working hard. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, action B, uh, the internal audit policy. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor will help us out with that. You might remember from our September meeting, um, we were provided uh, the same sort of visual that we have today, and we had a conversation about sort of the why. And uh, so Deputy Commissioner Trevor will sort of walk us through uh, the work that's happened on this between our September meeting and now. Deputy Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Yeah, this operationalizes what we talked about in September with our internal audit unit. We have internal auditors on both of the uh, two flagship campuses that have staff. Um, this is an effort to better connect uh, those efforts uh, to the Board of Regents and the overall uh, system. Um, uh, in uh, the name of a few things, shared services being one of them, uh, and just an overall better flow of information. Um, so we use the diagram that I've pulled up from September uh, that has uh, an administrative and functional reporting lines um, that direct the, the MUS internal audit to both um, the board as well as the uh, MSU and U of M president. Uh, we've put together a policy in conjunction with those internal auditors uh, Frida Hauser in our office uh, serves as that liaison. She has a wealth of experience in this area, uh, once upon a time a legislative auditor herself. Um, so this expands, uh, I think, the, the tool set of the system, better connects the information and direction and priorities of internal audit to the Board of Regents, um, increases their independence uh, which is a critical component. If you read through that policy, it's mentioned numerous times. Um, we would, uh, if the pleasure of the committee is to, or, to walk through um, the policy in more detail, we'd be happy to. Uh, but Mr. Chair, I would leave it um, at that as this is a new addition, a new policy um, that puts um, this new relationship in place. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Any questions from the committee on this item? Uh, Regent Sheehy? Can you explain briefly how it differs from the way it used to be? Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Sheehy, uh, yes, there was no direct, there was no dotted line coming from the MUS internal auditors on, that resided on our campuses um, to the board. So there 
administrative and functional reporting went straight up to the president. Um, at times, you can see where that could be a conflict. And so this expands their um, administrative reporting, I, I guess uh, the functional reporting, um, to the regions uh, and better connects their priorities and reporting lines and results um, to the overall system effort. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, any other questions from the board? I'm not seeing any. I, I had a, a, a pretty simple question. In the policy, it talks about the commissioner or the commissioner's designee. Um, just mapping that policy back to your diagram, is that the OCHI Director of Fiscal Affairs and Audit? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes it is. And that policy will allow us the ability to sort of adjust that position uh, through the years? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Regent Nystuen. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Uh, since uh, there's a uh, burgundy colored box and a blue colored box on the chart, I'd like to hear from the two campus CEOs their, their feeling, their understanding, their pers perspectives on uh, uh, being central to this, uh, to this. So if I could, please. Thank you. Regent Nystuen, members of the board. Um, the commissioner had shared this uh, chart with us before. Actually, this has been a few years in the making, and uh, I want to say about four or five years ago, um, we took the initiative of once a year, we will bring a report back to the commissioner in writing and in person in case he had any question about what our audit office had been working on. So. This conforms with the best practices in the nation, so I am in full support of this of this arrangement. Mr. Chair, Regent Nystuen, I fully agree. I'm in full support. I think this makes sense. You know, to have uh, our internal audit team working closely and focusing on those areas at the University of Montana, but also to have that line up to the board and to the commissioner is very important. I think for. Uh, <clears throat> for, for many reasons, and I'm, I'm fully supportive of it. Thank you, President. Uh, any other questions? Let's move on to Action C, authorization to sell the Mineral Research Center, Montana Tech. These next three items um, are in reference to Montana Tech, and uh, Director Muffick is going to tee, tee this up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, as you mentioned, item C is a Montana Tech item. It's a request for authorization to sell the Mineral Research Center. Uh, this item requests board approval to sell at the appraised value or higher the property in buildings in the Butte Industrial Park, lot 15A. Site includes 8.95 acres, a 5,002 square foot office building, a 3,200 square foot manufacturing building, and two 3,200-square-foot uh, shop buildings, as well as 2.3 acres of uh, unimproved parcel. The property was originally donated to the Montana Tech Foundation from the Anaconda Company in 1971, and then in 1983, the property was transferred to Montana Tech. Uh, the property is remote in nature as far as from the campus, and the campus has deemed this property to not fit uh, Montana Tech's uh, mission. The property has been appraised for $770,000, uh, the proceeds will go to the plant fund, and some of the proceeds will be used to purchase properties uh, in action item E on today's agenda, uh, if the board approves that item. Uh, the remaining funds will go into the plant fund and be used for campus maintenance projects. Uh, we project no uh, residual liability concerns after the sale. There are currently uh, two tenants uh, in, on the property, and uh, the current contract provides uh, the Montana Tech the ability to sell a property with 30 days written notice. It would not be a surprise to the tenants if tenants are aware of, of the plan. Um, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Ron. Any questions from the committee? Yeah, Regent Nice too. Thank you, Chair Lozar. So when you re refer to the uh, no contingent liability, is there environmental concerns that would still be resident back to the, to the campus going forward since we've owned it a number of years in Butte? Mr. Chair, uh, Reg Regent Nystuen, uh, the, the land was farmland prior to this, so uh, we're not too concerned. Uh, we've, we've checked with legal, we've checked with the campus, uh, not a lot of concerns regarding uh, a lot of uh, maybe abatement issues in the future. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, let's move to the next item, uh, 
Ron, authorization to remodel the Natural Resource Research Center. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Action item D. Uh, again, a Montana Tech item authorization to complete the Natural Resource Research Center. It's the third floor. Uh, this item requests approval to complete the shelled out space uh, on the third floor of the Natural Resource Center. When this building was previously approved and received spending authority, a uh, third floor was not completed. Montana Tech has since uh, received a $1 million donation, which uh, will allow them to complete the third floor and purchase equipment for four labs, a protection lab, an energy conversion lab, a power plant slash systems lab, and a training and learning lab. Uh, in addition, the operations and maintenance funding was previously authorized when this project was approved, so there will be no additional o and uh, as a result of this project. Uh, we will use general spending authority for this project. I'll stand for any other questions. Thank you, Ron. Any questions from the committee? Mr. Muffick, uh, can, uh, can I just comment on that? I think this is uh, a good example of our industry support, uh, the gift from uh, Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories in Pullman, Washington. Uh, this complements our power engineering program, uh, which is one of the finest in the nations, and SEL is, is one of those companies that represents some of the finest relay protection in the nation. So I think it's a testament to our electrical engineering uh, faculty in there, and it kind of completes a vision of a building that we built for $10 million, if you recall, and left, uh, it's about 3,000 uh, square feet of shelled space. So it, it finishes that building in a way that we intended, although we never knew what was going to be there until we could get that gift. So I just want to say publicly thank you to Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. Thank you, Chancellor Blackheader. Uh, any questions on that item? Moving on to the third Montana Tech item, authorization to purchase real property. Yes, action, action item E here. Uh, in accordance with Board of Regents Policy 1003.6, Montana Tech is seeking board approval to purchase real property, including land and structures at 1206 West Granite Street and 1501 West Court Street in Butte, up to the high appraisal amount and contingent on property inspection, appraisal results, and title report. Properties are in close proximity to the campus and it fits uh, tax plans for acquisition in the area. Uh, the Granite Street property borders uh, the property where Montana Tech's dorms are located and the house on the property will be used to uh, house resident advisors which will free up additional uh, dorm rooms for students. Court's property uh, is one of two lots on the west side of Court Street not owned by the campus. The property would allow for future development uh, for parking expansion near the campus in that area. Uh, no tenants are being displaced by this purchase. Uh, the total cost of the purchase is depending on the appraisal. Uh, based on the asking price, I think is about 260 between the two. So uh, we're thinking somewhere between 250 dollars and $300,000 would be uh, used. And that uh, would be from plant funds. And as I mentioned, that would uh, be replenished from uh, the sale of the uh, in action item C. I'll stand for any questions. Uh, thank you, Director. Any questions from the committee? Yeah, Regent Tuss. Did you indicate that no tenants are going to be displaced? Mr. Chair, Regent Tess, yes, that's what I indicated. Thank you. And then the second question that I had is it indicated that you're going to use, I'm, I'm assuming this is a uh, house, the Granite Street house, to house RAs. H how is that functionally going to work? Shouldn't an RA be on the dorm floor? Well, we have a, a couple levels of housing directors. Some of them live in the dormitory. And yet uh, we have, uh, at times we've had one of our housing directors actually be married with three children was living in the dorm. So this piece of property is the last, it's, it's a lot that sits right on the corner that they were never able to purchase when they built the Centennial dorm. And so it's a logical place for a, um, a house parent or something to live. While there are resident advisors in the dormitory, it's just a few minutes away, uh, it's literally, 30 feet away in some sense to, to get to the room. So it depends on what you have, you know, depends on who you hire. The person we have now currently is single and it makes sense for them to live in the dorm, but um, yes, I think it works. I think it works well, actually, because we've been renting a house for a while for the other dorm director. Uh, we have reorganized the, the, the system a little bit, but so we are actually renting a house so that he could have a family right next to the dorms. I just wanted to make sure there were no supervision or safety concerns with not having an RA on, on site. We have RAs on site. This would be the resident, the housing director. Okay, okay, gotcha. Thank yeah, you. okay, I want to be very clear with that. And, I, and I, 
pardon me, may I, up to, uh, this is part of the acquisition plan. I don't know if you remember, I presented a couple years ago where we were trying to consolidate the property. We're really close to that. We have most of the paper signed. So you're gonna see uh, this as part of that, if you will, to get the border lines of the Montana Tech campus straightened out, the alleys uh, vacated and all. We're really close to it. I know it's taken a long time, but uh, it's a very complicated process with all the old mining claims and, and all the way that the, the property is organized. So this is kind of a last piece, if you will, for putting that entire acquisition plan and property boundary realignment plan and I know it's not on the agenda but that's it was a couple of years ago and we got the nod member from uh, Regent Johnstone right okay all right thank you very much thank you Chancellor <clears throat> it sounds like he's getting ready to retire and he's wanting to finish all his projects at once absolutely Regent Lozar thank you very much uh, any questions from the committee before I move into uh, the information items Seeing none, thank you, Director Muffet. Uh, moving on to inform information uh, item A, uh, Governor's proposed budget. I know um, Ms. Smiley, Smiley and um, the Commissioner walked through this morning some exciting um, news in regards to, um, again, the Governor's uh, commitment to, to higher education, his commitment to uh, education in general, pre-K, et cetera. Uh, I think for us as a, as a board, that was a, a great news to, to hear this morning. I know his, his budget came out at, at 10 o'clock and um, it just happened to uh, line up with uh, the, the Regents meeting today. But I'd, I'd like to, it's been five hours since the budget um, has come out from the governor, but I'd like to ask if uh, either Deputy Commissioner or, or the Commissioner has any other details that they might be able to share with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, yeah, I can uh, go into a little more detail. I'd first like to um, point out someone else in the governor's budget office uh, who's here today, uh, the, our budget analyst for higher education, Jason Harlow. I see him there in the back. He can wave his hand just so you recognize him as he maybe comes to the reception later on tonight. Um, and uh, thank you, and we appreciate your help in this effort, as well as Ms. Smiley. So, uh, yeah, we've had five hours and crunched some numbers and just kind of give a general outlook um, on a very strong commitment by the governor uh, in his proposed budget. Uh, overall, $33 million in general fund increase over the biennium. Um, the majority, vast majority of that, about $24 million going toward the tuition freeze. $5 million, as we spoke earlier, uh, on need-based aid uh, with the match, $2.5 million per year. Um, and then uh, rounding that out is just kind of the general governmental uh, present law adjustments that would occur to the agencies, um, uh, the community colleges in, in on that. Um, I, I believe there was some new proposal in uh, the tribal college area for, um, if I remember correctly, uh, $350,000 a year um, to support high set testing at the tribal colleges. Um, so that's an, a new addition there. Um, and then, um, you know, some very basic things like the Board of Regents have a section that has a $6,000 increase to your operating budget so we can support um, these meetings and uh, it is mechanical uh, portions of the budget uh, that round out the, the total to the 33 million. So um, that sort of paints the overview of that. We will be. Uh, doing more detailed analysis and, and certainly um, connecting the dots uh, with the tuition freeze to um, very strong uh, data points and uh, keeping the board updated as we move into and through the legislative session. Excellent. <coughs> Deputy Commissioner, any questions from, from the committee? Commissioner, did you have any other, other thoughts? No. Uh, so again, we want to thank the governor for um, putting us in, in his budget at the level that he has. I mean, it says a lot about his values and how his, his values align with, with uh, sort of our vision as well for the state of Montana. So we, we thank the governor, so please let him know that we, we thank him. Um, I, I would just ask for the board as, as the specifics on the budget come out. Um, 
if you could send that to the board, which I assume you will, but uh, send it when you get it. Uh, moving on to the next item on information, which is item B, uh, update on residency policy. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, th we're going to have uh, Associate Legal Counsel Helen Thigpen come up to the podium and uh, give us an overview of this item. Hi, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about residency at 4 o'clock at the board meeting. So. Uh, Hopefully, if Heather can pull up the draft policy so we can have it up on the screen. Um, so this is, uh, just to remind everyone, this is an informational item only, and it's an update to the uh, residency policy, the board's residency policy. We've put together two documents for you, your review today. One is the red line version of the policy, so you can see what's being proposed. Hopefully, that's easy to review and the second document is a brief memo that I put together that just summarizes the changes if you want to take a, a quick look at that as well. Recently it's come to our uh, attention that there's an opportunity and I would say um, a significant need to revisit and revise the residency policy to provide some additional clarification to the campuses and students. Uh, over the past several years um, I think it's fair to say that the campuses have experienced some uh, high turnover in the positions that handle residency petitions from students. And in the commissioner's office, we regularly receive uh, calls from students and also um, we've received, as you know, um, numerous uh, formal appeals of residency decisions by the campuses. So therefore, we hope that with these revisions that we can provide uh, more specific direction that is consistent with how the policy has always been interpreted. We're also seeking to address how professional graduate programs, which have some unique characteristics, fit within the residency policy. So I think it's important to mention just at the outset here that residency decisions are tough. They're uh, made on a case-by-case -case basis. They require an investigation of each circumstance. Um, and the fundamental question is really whether someone intends to make Montana their true permanent and fixed place of residence or whether they're planning to be in the state to uh, primarily for the purposes of taking advantage of educational resources. So these residency decisions are critically important. They're big decisions. We think that campuses are doing a great job. We have great relationships with the folks that make these decisions. Um, and so certainly we, we want to recognize all the work that they do. Um, and while we would certainly want to encourage everyone to attend any MUS campus that they want to attend, the residency policy is designed to ensure that tax-supported in-state tuition is provided to true Montana residents. So the other piece I want to point out is that each state across the country has a, a different residency policy. Some are set by the legislature, some are set by system offices or at the campuses or through administrative rules or some combination of all of that. And in general, Montana, based on our research, falls somewhere from the uh, easy to moderate level scale in terms of a student's ability to gain residency. And before I jump into a more detailed explanation of the revisions that are being proposed, um, I want to clear up a few items that I think have been misreported, uh, and I'm always reluctant to say that, but um, maybe not as accurately reported as they could have been in some recent articles. Uh, first, nearly all of the revisions before you today in this policy are clarifications of uh, the existing policy and existing interpretation. Our intent really was to state the residency requirements more directly and clearly so that uh, students and campuses are um, applying the policy, or the campuses are applying the policy consistently across all of our uh, campuses. So, for example, a person seeking residency has always been required to show that they have uh, filed a Montana resident income tax return in compliance with Montana law. Um, if a student files a return as a resident of another state, this is a really strong indicator that they're not uh, a resident of Montana. And also, students have been required uh, to demonstrate financial independence to establish residency. And the other item I want to clarify briefly is that the proposed revisions in front of you affect a student, uh, do not affect a student who graduated from a Montana high school and is intending to start at an MUS campus within 
I think the policy provides four years to do that. So it's not, it's not in any way addressing those students. It's intended to clarify how someone who is moving here from out of state um, establishes residency for in-state tuition purposes. So, um, and I think, Heather, if we could pull up the other document with the red line version on it, that would be helpful for everyone to see in the room um, if they can read it. There we go. Um, so on the first page of the policy, it looks like there are numerous changes and that we're significantly changing the policy. And I want to emphasize that that is incorrect. Most of the revisions are simply clarifying existing requirements, including that the primary residency factors must be in place for the full 12 month period. So somebody can still come to Montana and establish residency within 12 months. This is just clarifying it and stating it more directly that those primary indicators of residency have to be in place for a full 12 month period. And you'll see some additional language in there clarifying the, uh, the uh, income tax and the documentation of financial independence. And that's the primary uh, reasons for the changes on the entire first page of the policy there. You'll see at the bottom of that page that we've provided some, some um, grace period for obtaining a uh, motor vehicle registration and a driver's license. An individual has 60 days to do that when they move to the state. So we thought, well then, we shouldn't penalize those students if they do that within that window as required by state law. So if they do that in 10 months, they can still obtain the benefit of residency if they're complying with state law. At the top of the second page, you'll see language that a person not be, may not be classified as a resident unless they've relinquished all residency ties to their former state of residency. That's always been the case. Um, that's simply restating the existing requirement that you can't take advantage of a right or privilege in another state if you're seeking to establish residency in Montana for in-state tuition purposes. At the bottom of page two, you'll see um, this is language that has to deal, uh, that has to do with um, what constitutes uh, part-time or full-time attendance. We're adding language there that would provide that online credits from any institution would count towards whether you're a half-time uh, student or a full-time student for purposes of the policy. And in that same vein, at the top of page three, uh, you'll see that for undergraduates only, uh, we are increasing the number of credits a student may take and still be considered half time from six credits to seven credits. We think that'll provide students with some additional flexibility to take another uh, uh, credit and still be considered part time for purposes of, of the policy. And that, that presumption is important because if a student is taking more than uh, what's considered half time, they're going to presu be presumed to be in the state for educational purposes and generally not be eligible for in-state tuition. So that's an important piece and we think that'll provide some additional flexibility. It will also be consistent with VA benefits. Uh, currently, um, I believe the VA requires veterans to take at least seven credits to be eligible for housing benefits under the, uh, through the VA. So it would align that, the seven credits would align with the, with the VA benefit. Subsection G, uh, looks again like it's a, a lot of revisions, but it's not. Uh, it was just easier from a drafting perspective to restate I mean, we've the language in that paragraph um, uh, more directly and just uh, retype the language instead of doing a bunch of different striking ads throughout that section. So what's really being changed in this section is um, you're the, a student would still need to be required to establish a 24-month period of residency. Now this is just for the witchy, whammy, professional student exchange programs. Um, so the 24 month period is staying the same. That's been in place since I believe 2011. Um, the only piece that's really being changed in there is that we want to provide some additional flexibility for somebody that's been a Montana resident in the past but that moved away, relinquished their residency, but they want to come back and reestablish residency for purposes of one of these programs. They can do that uh, under these revisions within 12 months instead of 24 months. We think that will help some people uh, in those situations that want to come back to Montana and more quickly establish residency for those programs. Finally, um, in subsection H, um, you'll see that we are proposing new language here. And I do want to highlight this for the board's consideration um, today. Uh, we would like to uh, amend the policy to provide that Students entering and admitted as out-of-state students in the professional graduate programs of law, pharmacy, and PT 
stay in those programs for the duration of their enrollment uh, in the program. Um, as we know, these programs are very rigorous and competitive. Um, they're designed to have a specific curriculum that prepares students for uh, specific licensing requirements. Um, and these programs have determined that there's a value in having a defined, uh, to use a higher ed term, cohort of students. However, as many of you may be aware, um, currently the policy presumes that any student, as I said, who's taking over six credits is primarily in the state for educational purposes and generally can't obtain residency. This has led to some issues because students can't go part-time and gain residency. So our approach uh, is to eliminate that presumption for uh, individuals in these programs and say if you start in this program, you stay in this program, you stay out of state uh, throughout the duration of the program. Um, so that is that would be a change and it's something we want to point out and again that would apply to the pro professional programs of law, pharmacy, and physical therapy and again those programs are where uh, the students uh, must go full-time um, while they're attending. So Madam Chair that's the really the conclusion of uh, my remarks in terms of, of what's being proposed. I want to encourage um, folks to submit comment to you as the board and to us at Ochi about uh, concerns or, or anything regarding the policy. If, they, if uh, people would like additional changes or clarifications, we're open to any and all comment anybody uh, wants to submit. But we would like to encourage the board to reconsider this uh, for a vote perhaps at your January meeting. Um, but we'll be open to working with you on it as we go forward and I'll be available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Thigpen. Any questions from the committee? Yeah, Regent Sheehy. Not on that committee, but. Or, or okay. on the board. Okay, great. Um, uh, first of all, just a comment. I wonder if the increasing residency appeals are sort of based on the change in our student population over the last couple of decades because, you know, kids used to come to school right out of high school and it was really the, the taxpayer that we were concerned about was the parent. The parents had paid taxes to support the kids' education through the Montana system, and now with so many students in a different um, situation, I think that's one of the causes of this um, increase in the residency appeals, is that they're looking at the, themselves as taxpayers, as the student, and they're not as worried about their parents who get pay, paid into the system for all of these years. So it doesn't really surprise me that this is happening. A um, couple of comments. I, I appreciate all of the work that you all did on this because I know how hard it is to draft these, these policies. I'm very supportive of what you did with H. I think out of all the student appeals that we hear, the, um, this idea that because I am unable to establish residency because I am unable to go part time, that, it, that appeal has had some appeal, I guess. And um, I'm glad to have that nailed down in this policy, I think you landed on the right space. And I think it gives people reading the policy the right expectation when they enter those three specific programs. I, I, so I just thought that was really well done. A um, uh, couple of other things. I, I was just a little, I didn't understand, I think I heard you say earlier that, that um, applicants have always had to pay or have always had to submit, this is up in C2B, have people always had to show that they're financially independent in order to get residency? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, excuse me, Madam Chair Regent Sheehy, as far as I understand, yes, they've had to show that they're financially independent and especially um, must show that a, a parent, an out-of-state parent, isn't claiming uh, that student as, um, as an exemption on their tax return. Okay, hmm. that's kind of surprises me. I mean, what if you're what if you have an in-state parent who's still claiming you, but you were away for a long period of time and came back? I don't know. It's a, that just struck me as kind of odd that they would have to show that they were financially independent. I like to express concern here for the trust fund babies that we're <laughs> shoving away. Uh, and then the only other thing I had was I didn't understand the thing about the car with the ten months. I wouldn't do math in the policy itself. I I would probably just say if you comply with the law, we're fine with you on it on the driver's license. That's all I have. Yes. Um, Madam uh, Chair, Regent Sheehy, thank you for the comments. Um, I should also point out, and I meant to say this in my remarks, that um, a couple of other states in our research have taken the approach where they've uh, kept students in the designation as a non-resident throughout the duration of their 
um, throughout the program. I, I believe that Utah does that with their law school and medicine, and I think Wyoming does it um, in some sense too. So there is some precedent for that, and I just I meant to point that out, and I and I didn't. But again, uh, comments are welcome, and we'll um, keep working on it. Any other questions, uh, Regent Nice Dune. Thank you, Chair Lozar. You know, <clears throat> you know, the first line of defense on this is going to be the campus, uh, uh, the campus folks, the CEOs at the campuses. So I'm hoping that there'll be good collaboration and vetting of this policy with them, and that they can come in and say this this really cleans us up. This will make it easier for us to to have an interpretation as to. Uh, in-state or out-of-state tuition. So uh, I think a lot of burden will fall upon you to give us guidance to say you got our stamp of approval. So as we look forward to January, I hope that, that comes comes across. Thank you. And just to add to that, I think uh, the campus feedback is really important, but as, as regents who do get a, a number of different uh, appeals on this particular topic, and we do receive emails directly from students that uh, that the public really takes the time and looks through this policy. It's obvious that Ochi has put a lot of time and energy into this and, um, and has done a lot of studying of uh, best practices. And uh, so we appreciate you uh, for doing all of that work, but, but really ask the, the public and, and students who have a, you know, a stake in this that they come forward and, and they provide their comment uh, either in our meetings or through emails or, or reaching out uh, directly to the campuses or OCHI. So uh, I think if there's no other questions, we can move on to the next item. Thank you, Ms. Thickman. And the next item doesn't have any links and so it's a bit of a mystery. <laughs> Um, no, Deputy Commissioner Trevor is, uh, is going to tee up the MUS Enterprise Systems. I think Mr. Thun Thunstrom is going to walk us through some diagrams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have an IT presentation for you, uh, Regent Sheehy, uh, no, for the entire board. And I, I want to stress that uh, this is uh, um, so connected to what we heard from the MSU C one uh, MSU and the seamless approach, um, uh, and, and really uh, see it as a board education item, but also um, kind of a jumping off platform to where we can go next and what kind of incremental progress can we make. Uh, we're lucky to have John Thunstrom, our MUS IT director, working for us at OG, and uh, with that level of IT expertise, I think you'll find he's not your average IT guy. This guy can really talk. Oh man, you really uh, set me up for failure right there. Uh, <laughs> you thought residency was an exciting topic, so uh, Banner is a really exciting topic for uh, your, your four o'clock afternoon here at the Regents meeting. What I wanted to do is just take a little bit of time to give you a very high level overview of what we call an enterprise resource planning software environment. And what that really means in terms of the university system is Banner. And so I'm going to give you an overview of how they look on the, on the two sides of the university system, and, and it will become evident what I mean by that as we go along here, assuming this mouse can work. Uh, I need a mouse pad. Do we have a clicker? Can you click me? Thank you. Okay, so uh, in terms of the diagram, what you'll see is that we've got several different colors of circles. The green circles represent physical hardware that resides on a campus. The blue, the light blue circles that you see there indicate a banner system that would be served on that campus. And then the dark blue circle that you'll see is a collection of third-party systems, thank you very much, uh, that, that interact with banner in one way, shape, or form. And so it's key to know that uh, the banner system provides the, the baseline functionality that you need in order to run a campus, uh, but there are many, many third-party applications that interact with that banner system that provide value-added um, you know, software benefits. Uh, for example, you might need a, 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 a CRM, a, a customer relationship management software, uh, like Radius, in order to aid in your recruitment efforts. Okay, so there, there can be upwards of 80 to 100 different third-party systems that interact with the banner system on any given campus. And we'll go over that a little bit as we go along. These blue lines that you'll see with the arrows, that indicates an interaction between a banner system and, the, and the, that collection of third-party systems. And the red arrow that you'll see indicates the relationship between several of the campuses using uh, the HR and finance systems that are on another local campus. 
Uh, for simplicity, I just want to point out that student refers to the general student, catalog, registration, financial aid, accounts receivable, et cetera, et cetera. All the other ancillary modules, excluding HR and finance as we go along here. So kind of coming out to look at the University of Montana system, what you'll see is that we've got three different hardware environments represented by those three green circles. And I'll get into a little bit of that uh, as we go along when we zoom in a little bit closer. What you'll see here is this is the University of Montana. They have their own standalone banner instance that runs both student and the HR and finance modules. And th you'll see those red arrows again coming into that HR and finance part indicating that there are other campuses that rely on Missoula for that information. Uh, the other thing that you'll note is that there are third party softwares, those little blue circles there that are running both locally on UM's hardware and then external on the cloud. As we zoom out, you'll see that those interact outside of uh, the local hardware environment. Moving on to the Helena College, you can see that little piece of green right there that indicates that Helena College has their own standalone banner interface or instance that's running on Missoula, uh, uh, Missoula's hardware. And again, they have third-party software that interacts both on Missoula's hardware and outside of Missoula's hardware in the cloud. Moving on to UM Western, you can see that they run their own set of hardware and their own standalone instance of Banner Student. Uh, you can see that there are also third-party interactions that are going in with them. And then you, again, you'll see that red arrow that indicates that UM Western actually interacts with the Missoula campus HR and finance on a separate level. The same thing holds true for Montana Tech. They run their own set of hardware, they have their own instance of Banner Student, but they rely, again, with that red arrow, on the University of Montana's HR and finance instances. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see the relationship. Those red lines, as you can see, again, that's the interaction with UM's HR and finance systems. Now, because they're commingled, there are codes that allow you to allow you to, to tell when an employee belongs to tech or an employee belongs to Western or the accounting belongs to you know one campus or the other. But they all roll up into a common uh, chart of accounts so that the accounting is is identical across all of the systems. And the other thing I wanted to make notice in here is the circle that you see in the middle that represents those third-party applications again. There are some systems that are shared amongst all four campuses. So they may have a common license, they share common application, and, uh, and you know, they work in conjunction with one another to, to use that particular piece of software. And the last thing I wanted to point out on the University of Montana side is that in addition, Dawson Community College and Miles Community College both have standalone instances of Banner that are run on the Missoula campus. And they, in turn, have their own third-party systems uh, run in the cloud or by uh, the University of Montana that are interacting with you know their banner instances there as well. Moving on over to the Montana State side, you'll see that for the four campuses of the Montana State University side, there is a single set of hardware that runs a single instance of banner. And you, you may have heard reference to that when we were talking earlier uh, about the one MSU project. Uh, zooming in a little bit closer, what you can see is a similar situation to the UM side, where the HR and finance modules are shared amongst all four campuses of Montana State. So the, all the information is commingled. Again, they have codes that allow you to tell which campus the information belongs to, but it all rolls up again to a common chart of accounts and allows for that ac accounting and employee information to be uh, commingled. On the student side, what you'll see is that there are logical software-based separations between each of the four campuses. So what does that mean? That means that they share a lot of processes, they share a lot of information in common and coding, but if I'm a student on MSU Northern, if I'm an employee over on the Great Falls College side, I am not allowed to see the information about students in the MSU Northern side. Now there are little bits of exceptions to that as we talked about with that MSU uh, the one MSU project, but in general, there is a, a distinct delineation between the information that's available uh, about students between the four campuses. There's a, a big separation between those things. Uh, you'll also see up in the corner there that, again, we have some third-party systems that are run locally on uh, MSU's hardware, a T2 that's a parking system. That's one of the other things that runs locally, uh, just an indication of that. As we zoom out here, you can again see that there are collections of third-party systems, some that serve a single campus, as you can see over on the left-hand side, 
Uh, and on the right-hand side, one might be serving only Great Falls College, one might be serving only MSU Bozeman. But then we have a collection of third-party softwares that are, that are included for all four campuses, and they share that with common licensing and common practices um, that allows them to share resources in that fashion. What I want to show you here is just when I talk about a collection of third-party uh, software, there are, this is a, a picture of what Banner Student on the MSU side looks like. There are 27 different applications that all connect in some fashion to the Banner Student module. Now these could be serving a single campus or multiple campuses or some combination of all of those and the colors of the lines that you see there indicate the flow of data. It could be coming out of Banner for a system, it could be going back into Banner for a system, or it could be a, a combination of both of those. The reason that I wanted to point this out is that I, just to indicate that the level of complexity when you make a small change in that core banner functionality, that every single one of these little applications that's out there and relies on that data uh, is affected. And the testing and, and all the regression things that have to go on to make sure that a small change you know, doesn't have huge effects, uh, it's a big deal when you're looking at the number of applications that are out there being supported by the banner system that's local. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that we at Ochi have a student warehouse and a finance warehouse, and information from both the MSU side and the UM side, as well as the community colleges, is all collected up into those warehouses that gives us the ability to do all the reporting that we do for you on FTE, uh, on operating budget metrics, and so on. And that, that's a topic that we could go into for another presentation, I won't get into it at this point, but just make note that all that information does eventually flow up uh, to Ochi so that we're able to do things for you. So zooming back out, the, the final things that I just want to make note of here is that you know th there's a lot of complexity here. Um, there's a lot of history behind why the University of Montana is set up the way that it is and the reason that Montana State is set up the way that it is. Uh, the University of Montana started out on Banner as a beta school back in the late 80s and you know Montana State adopted as a four campus system the banner system uh, when they brought it up in the late 90s, early 2000s. So there were a lot of different strategies that, that could have been taken advantage of by Montana State that weren't necessarily available on the University of Montana side. And that isn't to say that, that uh, you know, there weren't circumstances that led each campus to go in the direction that they went, but there's a lot of history behind all of that information. And so the final thing, uh, and I'll let you get out of here or, or not, not listen to me any longer, <laughs> is that the systems that are in place are very complex. And I know that we've been drilling on that all day today. Uh, I just want to keep, keep that at the forefront. There are multiple dependencies. As we continue to make progress in consolidating and sharing systems and expertise across the, uh, across the system, just know that incremental progress is being made in, in, in moving in that direction but that each change that happens requires a really careful examination of all of the downstream effects that a change to any one of those areas uh, makes. Our strategic goals and the decisions that we make toward the, uh, those ends are always balanced by the, you know, looking at what is justifiable from both a monetary and a human resource standpoint. So looking at any change that we make wholesale in the way that things operate you know, we look at a strategic goal, we look at what the return on investment is on that, and then we make incremental changes in order to advance those goals. And with that, I would stand for any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, John. I assume there are no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Did I blow no. your mind? Did I talk too fast? <laughs> no, uh, I want to be serious. Is there, is there any questions? Because I have a couple comments. Yeah, Commissioner. If I could, I, I would just to add a couple comments too. I, you know, I think this is sort of the baseline step. And we've talked a lot of times about Banner and how Banner relates. We talk about uh, one MSU. Uh, all those things at this point in our journey have to do with this chart. And you, you really can't get, I mean, even uh, Mr. Chair, your question earlier about cost, it's in this chart, um, what we can do, what we can't do. And so I, I really applaud the work that's been done. Um, John and Tyler have taken this on, but I, we, we first have to understand what we got before we can really get a grip on, all right, what pieces can we start to move um, ever so slowly, uh, but start to move to, to align with some of our other aspirations? Because really, uh, the, in 2019, with the dependence on technology, 
Um, we can't get to a lot of places that we talk about in terms of one MSU until we address some of this. And, and I will tell you, uh, this, this is a steep challenge for us, but uh, it's a start. And understanding it, I think, is a great first step. John, thanks for your efforts. Uh, Regent nice to thank you chair Lozar a um, question for you uh, have you have you had banner come in and show them this presentation and say all right I'm sure they've seen this before and to use some of their professional consultants as far as trying to helping understand what we have here and where we might go from here and to see how they could be part of the solution I can't imagine the price tag for running all these various systems right now and uh, and the opportunities we would have to save money, you know, get better data, more responsiveness, and uh, they'd have a satisfied client in in the Montana University system. So where are you with Banner in, in consulting with, with them? Uh, uh, Regent nice student. I guess the, the short answer to that is uh, yes, the campuses certainly uh, as a separate, separate entities are always in contact with their representatives at Elucian, the company that makes Banner and uh, are in tune with some of the strategies that may, um, that may make that kind of a transition easier. Uh, just yesterday, I had a ch a, an opportunity to speak with the CIOs of both MSU and UM uh, around a couple of topics, and one of those was the possibility of bringing in a Lucian uh, consultant in to just give us some kind of an idea of you know, what they think might be the best steps towards moving towards a more consolidated approach, whether that be in the cloud or whether that be on premise or, or moving things, um, you know, to a more centralized location. There are a lot of different options and I, I don't know from a cost standpoint um, what the, uh, you know, what the, what the possibilities are there. It will be expensive, I can tell you that. Um, but, but yes, I think that's a, a well taken suggestion and, and something that we certainly need to look at uh, moving forward is whether or not the, the vendor has good suggestions for us in, in ways that we can tackle this that won't be, um, you know, overly, overly onerous, I guess. Any other questions? Regent Sheehy. I just want to thank you for the presentation. Um, it actually made me very envious of Bree and Dalton because if I'd seen this uh, diagram of the bicycle three years ago, I would have understood about 50% more of what Tyler Trevor has been talking about. <laughs> so thank you. That really was very understandable. I saw the bicycle as well. Hello, um, call it the bicycle. I don't see it. <laughs> it's missing in the handlebars. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. I see oh, a basketball. Uh, court. President Bodner. Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and John, I'd agree. I, th I think that's a fantastic uh, way to describe it and very, very good job of simplifying uh, complex topics. So thank you very much. And I, I would just, you know, there's questions of cost here, right? There's questions of efficiency. There's also significant questions of enterprise risk mm -hmm. that, uh, that I think this board and this system uh, need to take into consideration as we look at the system and how much of this is, is uh, are in old systems are, are threats to this, to this university system. So I commend this group for, uh, for the work on this and I would tell you this is something we're looking hard at, but it is a system question. And I would just urge us as we think about this, we've talked about cost, there is, significant uh, cost to not addressing this as well. Thank you, President Bodner. <clears throat> and I'll, I would uh, piggyback off what everyone said, uh, John. Fantastic presentation. Uh, we are so lucky to have you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, and earlier I asked the question when we were talking about one MSU, um, the question about budget and coordination. and. This is the same question, of course, that, um, that I'd be asking the commissioner and I've asked uh, on other projects is what the cost will be and know that this board um, supports the efforts moving forward and, um, you know, the president's point, there, there, are, there is a lot of risk, um, but we have to prioritize this and we have to put money behind it. And so, you know, make sure that this, we continue to keep this as a top priority and if there are costs, uh, bring them to us and, and let's figure out how we can get this done and get this done as relatively as quickly as possible so we don't have any um, enterprise issues. At Region Nice too. Thank you, Chair Lozar. I, uh, from my private sector life at, uh, at our bank, we had 14 different divisions with 14 different general ledgers and 14 different 
everything. And we went through a massive project. It took us a year to do it. But what we ended up doing is go out and creating a whole new bank, chart of accounts, general ledgers. Uh, it was an incredible. It sounds like common course numbering for the banker world. But what, what ended up happening is we created one standard uh, and, and then we migrated every system into one common core, if you will. As that's how our consultants worked with this. And I know that there's turf issues between campuses and all this and, uh, and all those kind of things, but you know, uh, from an enterprise risk standpoint and from a regulatory risk standpoint, we had to do it. And the longer we waited, the more expensive it got and the, and the bigger the, the challenges were relating to somebody had to get the black and white shirt on with the whistle and be the referee. And, uh, and and so forth. But as an organization, we're much better off. So kind of lessons learned. Uh, you have to bring in the consultants, the professionals to do it. I have a lot of confidence in the staff here, but um, th this is not totally uncharted territory that some people could really be there. And you might be surprised at the amount of money we could ultimately save in the end and the headaches and the data integrity and the quality, uh, the whole nine yards could be really uh, together. So my challenge is to have it done by next Christmas, okay? There we go. <laughs> uh, and I, I appreciate your comment. I just wanted to add on to one, one more thing of that, if I, if I could. It, just to point out that the chart of accounts, in particular on the finance side, actually is very standardized across it, the system. What is the so that's one thing where, where we do have a distinct advantage, where, where the on accounting on both ends different. rolls up to a common set of accounting that we, that we deal with on the OCHI end. Um, we, we've made a lot of steps, and that's why you see those simplified things on HR and finance. Those areas are much simpler to attack than they are on the student end, uh, and we've actually made a lot of progress in that, even from, from starting with the HR and finance modules with Banner back when we did. So, Mr. Chair. Yep. Okay. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, just uh, I just want to make sure that we're all setting some realistic expectations though, to be honest. Um, so we did hire a consultant and we did some work on this in 2013 and it actually was one of our top legislative requests. Um, just to be clear, in 2013, the estimates were around 25 million if we were looking at one system. And uh, the other kind of caveat was that other states had done this and looked at it and, and at that point in time, no state had gotten uh, it done without being about 100% over on cost. So uh, it, it's a big project, but it, it's also one I think we need to embrace. And I just want to, I just want to set realistic expectations of cost and where we go. Uh, to to say that um, we're going to charge the the IT side of the house with uh, one ERP by uh, any given time is a very expensive proposition, one that we may not be able to do on our own. Uh, without some outside help in, in terms of driving resources to it. But uh, I think the first step and, and part of this exercise is to say, given that bite at the apple is pretty big, what are incremental steps that we could do exactly. to help with enterprise risk, to help simplify, and, and ultimately to help with um, starting to drive these two systems together? Our, our thoughts are is that the more we could create two systems instead of four or however you divide up that chart um, and have them look more similar at some point if we start to drive similarity on at least both sides of the divide it may get easier with uh, with banner with Lucian to sometime pull those together but this is a multi-year uh, multi-phased project uh, keeping in mind we we know that is uh, some endpoint that we need to continue to consider. Uh, it's expensive. It's going to take some time, but I, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And and yes, uh, Vice Chair and I, student, I think the savings in the end would be substantial. Uh, it's just how do we get over that hurdle to get there? And and those are things that we're going to consider and we're going to bring uh, in front of you as we move forward to see what our options are, how we can start driving this thing toward what we need in the end. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Commissioner, and, and thank you, John. Um, we look forward to the next round of updates on this, this topic. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
Committee members, we've got four additional items uh, in the information section of the, the committee meeting today. Um, I'm gonna just ask that the, the presenters um, make sure we keep it as short as we can um, and to the topic. There is a, a 4.45, we, we're planning on having um, uh, somebody else come in for their portion of the agenda. So we haven't had a break this afternoon, so if we can just ask for each of those, the, the final four to keep it uh, quite short. Thank you. Uh, next up is information item D, uh, Dawson Community College enrollment update and plan. Deputy Commissioner Trevor, if you could tee this up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd ask uh, Dawson Community College President Scott Mickelson to come to the podium, and I'd just make a comment that the reason that we have this on the agenda is uh, in law last session, House Bill 647 uh, requires the Board of Regents to have a report um, and monitor the enrollment, uh, understand the enrollment plan of any campus that has community college that has fewer than uh, 200 resident students. Um, Dawson, uh, since that time, has made progress towards that uh, 200 student benchmark. Um, I believe they're at this semester at 180 resident students, um, up from somewhere like uh, from 140. So they're doing well, uh, but uh, we'd ask Scott, uh, uh, President Mickelson, to uh, just make a couple quick comments uh, related to that enrollment management plan of theirs. Thanks, Deputy Commissioner uh, <clears throat> Trevor and, and Chair Lozar and the, and the board. You know, um, it's, it's exciting to visit with you about this because we have made great uh, growth. Uh, just from in the last year, we were at 181.6, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, <laughs> and uh, that is a 7% growth over last year. And so we're excited about that. We did, feel sh we did fall short on our goal on our action plan. Let me just address that here for about 10 seconds. We're, we're looking at that. What we did is we said we want this to where, be our fall enrollment, but in Montana, the end of term is official and the analyzed is official. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust those numbers for our annualized so it becomes official, but then use the census and the end of term as kind of our indicators. Are we heading in the right direction or do we need to change things up a little bit? Um, some of the end of the, if we look at the end of the term, so we combine summer and fall, we're tracking right now between 205 and 207 in resident FT. So for the official number, we should be over the 200 resident FT. So we're, we're watching that pretty close. Some ways we've done that, we've done some late starts. We've done a six week and a 10 week late start. We're reaching out to more high schools in Eastern Montana, dual credit enrollment opportunities, more partnerships with high schools and partnerships with area businesses uh, providing credited courses for them. Um, our annualized FT, we're, gonna sh we're shooting right now for 225, so we're hoping by the time we get to annualized FT, we're at 225 resident FT. I um, want to talk to you just about some highlight things that we're looking at over the next, for the long term, to keep this growth going. Um, freshman yields at Dawson Community College two years ago were 39%. Right now, we're tracking at about 54% on conversion from application to enrollment, so that's positive. We're working on perfecting the funnel. Enrollment has increased by 28% overall from fall 17 to fall 18, and 44% from fall 16 to fall 18. And we're not done yet, we're still continuing to go. We're looking at ownership programs. We wanna bring kids in, from the state of Montana in business and agriculture, and we want to show them how to own businesses and stay in the state and be productive members in businesses. We also wanna to reach to kids from outside of Montana and say, you know what, come to Montana to start your business to be involved in agriculture, stay in Montana. So we're working very hard on that, and we'll have some announcements on that. We're working on an ag energy center. We haven't got the prospectus all done, but we have started visiting with people outside of the state and within the state that are interested in, in donating into this structure. Um, we've had the largest um, unduplicated headcount growth this past fall. We were a 33% increase over the previous fall. Right now, spring is tracking 16 applications ahead of last spring. Resident FT is up 16 resident FT ahead of last spring. And uh, so all indicators are looking good that we'll have a good, strong spring start and uh, finish strong for the year. Thank you. I'll stand for any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, President Mickelson. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments? Uh, Thank you, and uh, I think that was a fantastic quick report, and I know uh, how hard you're working out on, at, at the college, and 
Um, want to thank you again for inviting us there in the spring and, and for kind of going through this plan in more depth at that point. And this was a, this was a fantastic update and a lot of uh, growth areas. So that, All right. appreciate it. Thank yep. you. Yep, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, <clears throat> C action or information E C H E action steps. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would quickly address this. This picks up on uh, a topic that the commissioner addressed in his uh, uh, in his report earlier today on the immediate action that um, uh, our office, the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education, have taken in relation to uh, first uh, the Cleary uh, Act and. Um, Campus compliance, uh, we mentioned the um, commissioner's directive, uh, the commissioner outlined that, so um, that, that's just a reminder that uh, is, we've set the um, actions in place to ensure consistent processes, procedures, and reporting. Um, to, uh, that's the immediate um, steps we've taken. If we're looking at this on a broader scale in terms of overall risk and the footprint that the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education um, is uh, moving forward with in our office. Um, we look at it um, kind of in three uh, three pronged approach. Um, we talked to you earlier today about the internal audit build out and how the progress we've made there and drawing a stronger connection with internal audit to the Board of Regents and the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Ed. We're also actively right now searching for an MUS compliance officer. Uh, this would be part, uh, a new addition to our legal team, but serve as a leader um, and a system coordinator for uh, federal civil rights um, regulations and laws um, and, and really the fabric that connects our campuses together in um, the same vein as the commissioner's uh, directive on the Cleary Act, uh, but broader. Um, and, and then we see this evolving um, kind of in a, uh, umbrella with those uh, two positions um, into a, an, an actual office within our office on uh, risk, audit, and compliance, and that we would uh, uh, work into a position that would manage that office, uh, something like an in, uh, enterprise risk manager, someone very uh, knowledgeable with, with experience and expertise. Um, in that very broad area. We don't currently have that level of expertise in our office. We recognize that. Um, and if we're going to have a footprint, we absolutely have to have someone um, with that expertise to tie this whole unit together. So that's the, in the name of the kind of small system office we have in comparison to larger states, um, that would be our first kind of glimpse at, at what a what an office of risk uh, management would look like. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Any questions for Tyler? So, uh, Deputy Commissioner, if I'm hearing you correctly, there's a chance that we may be adding one or two individuals to the, uh, to the OCHI agency. Yep, Mr. Chair, I would anticipate by our next meeting, we would be introducing our uh, MUS compliance officer. Um, and then uh, making plans for how we tie this all together with a, a, a true enterprise risk manager uh, to develop this office. <clears throat> Thank you, any questions? Seeing none, let's move on to information F, uh, American Indian Hall Project MSU. Uh, Dr. Muffet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, or members of the committee. I just have a brief uh, introduction on this project. As you mentioned, it's an information item regarding an exciting future project at MSU Bozeman. MSU is planning for the construction of a new academic facility to create additional classrooms and student support spaces to accommodate growth in student enrollment, specifically in the number of American Indian students. We bring this item to the board now to provide an update because the scope of the project has changed. I will turn it over to President Crisato to talk about the specifics of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I do that, uh, we'll likely bring a board item, uh, an action item to this board in May uh, for this project. Uh, that's assuming we are able to uh, achieve the additional uh, spending authority, authority only from the legislature. Right now we have $8 million in uh, spending authority from a previous session. Uh, we'll be adding another $12 million for a total of 20, and that is in the executive budget. Uh, check that earlier today. So with your, uh, uh, with your approval, I'll turn it over to President Crisado for the specifics. Oh, oh. President Crisado? Yes. Uh, Regent Loser, um, uh, dear Regents, 
It is uh, with a great sense of pride uh, that, I, that I bring this project to your attention. As, uh, as, you, as you know very well, this has been actually decades uh, in the making. In 2005, Montana State University obtained um, legislative approval in authority only for an $8 million at that time known as, as an American Indian Student Center. Um, that was when we had 268 uh, Native American students in campus. As the campus has continued to evolve and, 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 and get more complex in terms of student enrollment and programming, we, and also due to inflationary cost in local construction costs, we knew that the, what $8 million was uh, going to buy in 2005. That was not uh, a reality anymore for us. We have been uh, reaching out to incredible donors of Montana State University. And uh, as of last year, we had been raised a little, uh, almost $4 million. Then um, some incredible things started to happen. Um, our students, the associated students of Montana State University will come to you with a request uh, uh, asking to use $2 million in construction fees to be dedicated to this building. Um, and again, as, as Ron has mentioned, then we realized that we needed to start talking about this needs to be an academic uh, building. We need to have more classrooms. We need to move our Native American Studies programs um, to it. So with $6 million almost uh, in pledges, uh, we had an incredible, we received an incredible gift on October the 8th, uh, a $12 million gift which takes us to $18 million. We are now committed to raising uh, $2 million be be between now and December the 31st. We are well on track to um, meeting that goal. And here's the thing, from 268 students in 2005, this last fall when we open our doors, we have 766 Native American and Alaska, Alaska Native students. So. This is the kind of project that allows us to fill our heart with joy and with pride that this is a promise that we will be able to fulfill. Thank you, President Cruzado. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Regent Albright. I just want to say congratulations. That's fantastic and, and um, not only shows your commitment to our Native American students, but um, just fantastic work. I'm, I'm so thrilled. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I just had a comment and I, I wanted to congratulate you on, on the, the very massive gift that you were able to, to bring in. And I know your team has been working on this for a long time, so kudos. Kudos to them, and certainly uh, thank, we want to thank all the donors who uh, made this happen, all the con contributions from our tribal communities, too, to sort of weigh in on what this might look like and, and help guide you, guide you through this. So this is, a, this is a big deal, so congratulations. Thank you. Uh, last item in the Budget Admin and Finance Committee meeting today is information item G, audit reports. Yep. Um, Tyler? Yep. Um, Mr. Chair, just a quick uh, a note on these reports. So um, annually at the November board meeting, we receive the audits from um, our campuses with foundations. Um, uh, we have uh, four out of six of those uh, ready and prepared for you on the agenda uh, today. Uh, two of them will be forthcoming at a later meeting. We just didn't um, have those uh, at, at this time. Um, and so we'll be picking those up at a later date. Uh, we also have a uh, clean audit, and all of those were clean audits uh, that we have uh, posted. We also have a clean audit results on our self-funded workers' comp program. Um, all of them listed here for your information. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, that closes uh, the Budget Admin and Finance Committee two minutes behind schedule. Uh, and we started 15 minutes late, so, so do the math. Do, so do the math. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I hand it back over to you. So noted. Thank you, Regent Lozar. Uh, at this moment, we would like to um, 
finish off our fabulous day with uh, representatives that will tell us a little bit about the Montana Campus Compact. And we have Andrea Vernon and Andrew Sellingson coming forward. Nice to see you. Thank you. Good thank you. Good afternoon. Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to share with you the work of Montana Campus Compact in celebration of our 25th anniversary, advancing the public purposes of higher education in Montana to improve community life and educate students for civic and social responsibility. I'm Andrea Vernon, I'm Executive Director of Montana Campus Compact, and we are a network of 18 colleges and universities here in Montana that work to create meaningful impact. We engage students in service to their communities, we catalyze campuses to meet community needs, and we work to revitalize democracy through community engagement. We provide resources and support for our campuses for service learning and community engagement high impact practices. You can read more about our work in our annual report that's out in the foyer and will be available tonight at the reception as well. Um, I want to take a minute to thank our statewide CEO council that's made up of community leaders and campus CEOs, our advisory committee members, and our board chair, uh, President Jane Karras of Flathead Valley Community College. It's through collaborative and committed leadership that makes this work happen in our state. Our network here in Montana is part of a larger network nationally of over a thousand colleges and universities that are committed to the public purposes of higher education. And we're fortunate today to be joined by our national president, Dr. Andrew Seligson, who will say a few words about the importance of this work. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrea, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Montana Campus Compact on 25 years of extraordinary work in building community and strengthening our democracy both here in the state and contributing to our national mission. Montana also contributes in a variety of ways to our National Campus Compact Network, uh, the contributions of President Karras, the contribution of President Bodner and the university here as hosts of Montana Campus Compact, and President Cruzado, who has recently uh, joined our national board uh, of directors for Campus Compact across the country. So we appreciate all of your contributions to our network. Across the country, we are working on this initiative to build our communities and strengthen our democracy by connecting higher education to practical work that matters to people by addressing challenges in communities in areas like health and educational attainment and community economic development. And we also have a specific focus on building the capacities of students across the country to contribute as citizens to our democracy. I think all of us recognize that we are in a challenging moment nationally as we have increasing difficulty working across differences productively to find solutions to public problems and resolve those problems in ways that serve all of us. And we see our goal as ensuring that our higher education institutions are focused on creating opportunities for students to work in productive ways that break down barriers and achieve public goods so that they can both learn about and experience what it means to, to solve those problems together in ways that are innovative, creative, and create better futures for our communities. So at the national level, we have been focused both on building our membership to engage even more institutions, especially community colleges, with a goal of increasing our national membership in that sector from 200 to 500 members. We are focused on bringing together presidents and chancellors for discussions of the important and pressing issues facing their campuses and communities so that we can think together about how to work toward new solutions. We are focused on improving our professional development for faculty and staff since so much of our work relies on innovative teaching and creative programming in both the curricular and co-curricular spaces for students. And we're focused as a network on increasing our own capacities for collaboration and integration so that we maximize the use we are making of the resources that are invested in us by institutions, by donors, by foundations, uh, and through the grants we leverage from the Corporation for National and Community Service. The work in Montana is exemplary in many ways, especially in its leadership in this work of taking national service opportunities and converting those into practical work both for students and recent graduates in communities across the state. And so VISTA and AmeriCorps volunteers working through Campus Compact in Montana are making a difference on the ground all across the state. And again, that's a, a huge contribution in setting an example for our network and for, our, for colleges and universities nationally. 
Uh, so again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you a little bit about our work. The 25th anniversary represents the fact that Montana was an early adopter in, in coming together to become part of the Campus Compact Network, and you have been a consistent contributor to that work, uh, and we, we really value the relationships here and your contributions to the national network. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sellingson. It's great to have you here. Where are you based out of? Yeah, so Campus Compact's national office is in Boston, Massachusetts. And in fact, I can share one of our programs is the Newman Civic Fellows Program, which is a, a student fellowship. We have four fellows this year from Montana. And just this weekend, uh, we will have our national student conference of, of Newman Civic Fellows. So I will be racing your four Montana fellows back to Boston to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, where we will be gathering. Well, that's fantastic. Well, it's wonderful to have you here, and thank you so much for, for giving this update. Um, and thank you, Andrea, of course, for all of your continued work. Uh, any questions from members of the board? Um, thank you so thank you. much. Enjoy your visit to Montana. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have successfully, thank you, Regent Lozar, uh, made it to the end of our, our agenda today. And at this time, I would like to invite anyone to come forward for public comment and would simply ask that you state your name. Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record, Marco Farrell with MFPE. Uh, I'd like to come up today just to talk to you a little bit about a couple partnerships. One of them was mentioned earlier today, and I'd like to thank the commissioner for recognizing our efforts with the six mil levy. It was truly our pleasure to be a part of that and to work with you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, shout out to my colleague, Lauren Caldwell, who really did run that campaign from our office. Lauren is an outstanding talent and is our political director, and uh, just happens to be out of town on this, uh, uh, this weekend, or else I'm sure she would be here to celebrate with all of you. But it was a great effort. Uh, we're really, really, really pleased with the, with, with the outcome. And, and, and it is a partnership, and, and, and we want you to know that that our members are in partner with you all and in, in the work you do at your campuses as well as the regions to, to make this a great place for our students um, and for the faculty and staff that we represent. So it was a, it was a great effort. I also want to uh, talk a little bit about another partnership uh, that uh, uh, Angela McLean talked briefly about. That, that's National Board Certification for Teachers. And I, I want to thank uh, your the MUS, uh, in particular MSUB and the University of Montana, for, for partnering with us on our, on our facilitation in, uh, of national board candidates. We have a three-day session called Jumpstart in which we bring candidates uh, for national board uh, to the, those two campuses in the summer, and we provide a really in-depth facilitation for them. And I want to thank those campuses for, for partnering with us and hosting us. And uh, we have uh, Angela uh, got me connected with uh, Virginia Braithwaite at uh, MSU Northern, and we're going to try to do some work with National Board Certification on the High Line and use MSU Northern perhaps as a hub. So those kinds of partnerships you probably don't hear about very often, and uh, I just thought I'd bring it to your attention, but those are the K-12 higher ed partnerships that, that we're part of, and, and they're very important to, to all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farrow, and thank you again for being a champion for higher education. Hi, I'm Alex Butler, uh, ASUM President, uh, Madam Chair, Regents, President Bodner, Cruzado. Uh, I wanted to extend a thank you to coming to our grand opening today for the Student Group Resource Center. It has been a long and uh, arduous process to kind of get it created and get it going. Um, and so it honestly meant a lot for all of you to be there to kind of be in that, share that moment with us because um, it's something we realized at ASUM we haven't really address supporting 
student groups, and uh, this is kind of our first step in really addressing, um, you know, kind of our lack of support in that regard. So I don't see this as the end solution to this. Uh, I honestly see this as a first step to many to come before. I don't even know what it's going to look like in the end, uh, but today you all got to see that first step. So I just wanted to extend a, a thank you to you all for uh, coming to that today. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Taylor Blossom. I'm the ASMSU president and the vice president for external affairs for Montana Associate students, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, and both of the presidents. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to come up here and thank everyone who helped out with the effort to pass the six mil this year. That is such an important thing for students, and the fact that that passed is such a relief, and we're really excited about it moving forward for the next 10 years. Um, so yeah, thank you for everyone who helped out with that, and specifically the hundreds of people who donated to that effort to make sure that that passed. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go over all those names, but I would like to go over, um, I have a list here of all the organizations um, that donated to that effort and helped support it um, that I would like to thank. Uh, Three Rivers Communication, uh, Montana AFL-CIO, Allegiance Benefit Plan Management, uh, Barrett Hospital and Healthcare Incidental Committee for I-185, Beartooth Billings Clinic, Big Sky Values Pack, Billings Chamber of Commerce, Billings Clinic, uh, Missoula Blackfoot, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, BNSF Railway Company, Bozeman Area Chamber of Commerce, Christian Sampson PLLC, CHS Refinery Pipeline and Terminal Operations, C Missoula Community Medical Center, DA Davidson and Company, Deer Lodge Medical Center, Ferguson Federal Credit Union, Fives the Most LLC, Folkford Family Foundation, Ford Montana, Glacier Bank Corporation, Janet Ellis for Legislature, Missoula Chamber of Commerce, Montana Bankers Pack, Montana Chamber of Commerce, Montana Credit Union League, Montana Economic Developers Association, Montana Farm Bureau Federation, Montana Hospital Association, Montana Law Pack, Montana Medical Association, Montana Public Interest Research Group, Montana State University Alumni Foundation, Montana State University Billings Foundation, Montana Tech Foundation, Moulton Bellingham PC, MSU Northern Foundation, Next Frontier Capital, Northwestern Energy, Opportunity Bank, Pacific Source, Payne West Insurance, SCL Health Systems, St. Peter's Hospital, St. Vincent Healthcare, Stuart Title, Stockman Bank of Montana, Taylor Luth Group, Taylor Luther Group, PLLC, the, UM, the U of M Western Foundation, University Faculty Association, University of Montana Foundation, Univision Incorporated, Washington Corporations, WGM Group, as well as I'd like to extend a thanks to all the members of the Montanans for the Six Mill Committee and give a special shout out to the uh, Montana Federation for Public Employees and their incredible uh, donation. Marco Farrow, I know their representative is here. Thank you so much for everything you did for Montana students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you for your efforts. More public comment. Hi everyone. Um, this is actually the first time I've ever spoken on one of these, so I apologize if I'm too close or too far. My name is Alice Boyer. I am the president of the Kiao Native American Student Association here at the University of Montana. We put on the powwow every year at the Adams Center, um, and we are working on putting together some other fun cultural group activities for the university. I am here on behalf of Kiao as well as to introduce Ka'au, who is the president of the Pacific Islanders Student Association. I believe that's what it's called.
Aloha. Aloha. Let's try that one more time. Aloha. I am the president of the Pacific Islanders Club here in University of Montana. And um, we are here along with Alice and I, and we have an extremely exciting group waiting for you down the walkway here. There's about 30 performers that are waiting to invite you over after this is all said and done. I will try to be as warm as possible as I walk you folks over there. <laughs> As I shiver to the Native American Center, there you will have your reception. I thank you folks so much for all your hard work and everything that you've done throughout this year, um, years, um, today especially, and we would like to really have you folks as our guests, the Kiayo um, Native American Student Group, as well as the University of Montana Pacific Islanders Club, as we host tonight for you, your reception after tonight is done in just a few minutes. So please, please join us. They they are ready, they're excited, and a little nervous um, to perform for you folks and to see what diversity is here on our campus. So please join us and be a part of it, and we look forward to seeing all of you. Aloha. Aloha. I am, um, I'm gathering that there is no further public comment. Um, President Cruzado. Yes, just very briefly. Um, I, uh, I was remiss in saying when, when we discussed the American um, Indian Hall uh, that I want to send a very special message of gratitude to our partners here in the, in the Payne um, Family uh, American Indian Center. Uh, they were instrumental in making that gift come true. We reached out to them and see if our uh, donor, if our main donor could come to Missoula and, and, and experience what you have here. And this was a, an incredible example of collaboration and I just want to make sure uh, that that does not go uh, unsaid. Um, finally, on your desk, you, we left a copy of our six and next to the last um, report of our strategic plan. As you know, we will, we are in our last year of our seven-year strategic plan. This is a great summary of what happened last year. And if you have any questions or if you have any recommendations about any of this material or about our new strategic plans, we will be happy to hear your recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, President Cruzado. President Bonder. Oh, no, I'm, uh, Madam Chair, I was just going to say, and sorry for my <coughs> bout of coughing there. Um, the, uh, I, I was going to echo Kyle's comments and tell you that be careful because some of you might end up, as I was pulled into, hula dancing with Kyle. I'm, I'm just saying, be, be <laughs> forewarned. And for everyone else, be there. Martha. So be there. <laughs> So, and uh, we're, we're very excited to welcome everyone over to the, to the Payne Family Native American Center. Thank you, and thank you, President Bonner. And again, um, I, ex my, I extend my gratitude for a wonderful day that was uh, beautifully hosted by the University of Montana. Um, I invite, as you have, to everyone to join us in a reception at the Payne Family Native American Center. And uh, for today, we will recess and begin tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. right here. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you all for a great day. We are recessed.